Thank you, everyone. If you could please settle down, we're going to be starting in five minutes. Thank you for joining us again. We will be starting in five minutes. because we're starting right now. Can you please turn this microphone? Hello everyone, we will be starting right now, so if we could please settle down. Excuse me, could we please settle down? We will be starting right now, thank you.
Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Ukraine House. On behalf of the Ukraine House Organizing Committee, we're thrilled that you're here. It is my pleasure to introduce the moderator of our next panel, Olya Rudnyeva. She's the executive director of the Elena Pinchuk Foundation and coordinator Help Ukraine Center Initiative. Olya. Hello, everybody. Uh, 3 p.m. and we are about to start our video link with the First Lady of Ukraine. Um, so I would like to welcome the First Lady of Ukraine. Paniola, and I think that you see uh, the audience here and how excited everybody to see you smiling on the screen. It's an amazing moment. So we will start our session that will last for one hour and we will have a room for uh, Q&A at the end. Um, Pani Olena, I would like to start probably with a question. Uh, you know, I was thinking that it's a very symbolic day today. 24th of May, exactly three months from the large-scale invasion of Russia. And um, here is a lot of people, international media, people from all over the world, and they basically source information about the situation in Ukraine from media and from the news. And here is a unique opportunity to learn from you from the first hand about the situation in Ukraine. Can you tell us how it feels and what is happening in Ukraine from your angle and how the war in Ukraine is look like at the moment? Well, first of all, good afternoon. I would like to welcome everyone. And it is very pleasant to see such a huge audience. It means that you would like to hear Ukraine. And that's very pleasing. And now we are trying uh, to join any discussion sites which are accessible to us. We have to talk loudly of what is going on in Ukraine. And I would like very much not only hear me today, but also that not only listen to me, but also hear us so that as many people as possible will know the truth about Ukraine. That's why I'm so grateful to you for being here. And I hope that we are going to spend this hour very usefully for all of us. When when I was thinking of how should I tell what's going on to us now, I, I recalled that, that the site is in Switzerland, and this is the country with a beautiful landscape, maybe the best landscapes in the world. And if I may, I would like to start telling you about the situation in Ukraine from its landscapes and sites. And I would like us to look at several slides so that you will feel what's happening to all of us now, please. Well, the first slide. This is Mariupol. It's the city port with the unique metallurgical works. And this is the way it looked. And now you can see the way it looks now after the three months of the Russian bombing by missiles and planes. The next picture is from a team. This is a beautiful town and it is located in the vicinity of Kiev and the young families were building their first homes who were commuting to work to Kiev. And these housing estates look like this now. And it's a piece of luck if the residents of those buildings are still alive. And this is Kharkiv, the university city, the, the city with more than one million population. We always were referring it to as the student city. And this is before the Russians came and after the Russians came. And this is Severodonetsk. This is the way it looked like. And this is what it looks now. And at present, this is most probably the hottest point in Ukraine because the Russians are leveling the city at this moment to the ground. I would like also to show you the pictures of the Ukrainians, the people who used to live in these cities, who were building their plans, were 
growing and raising their children. They were dreaming. They were traveling. And this is uh, the picture of Valeria and her daughter Kira from Odessa. They were killed by the Russian missile. Kira and Valeria were killed in their apartment. And Natalia and her daughter Yana from Kramatorsk. They were at the railway station just ready to get evacuated and the Russian missile just hit the railway station. Now they lost their lower limbs. This is Oksana. She is a medical nurse. She's a medical nurse from Lysychansk. And Oksana was wounded due to the explosion of the Russian landmine. And this is a photo which was taken in the hospital. In this hospital, she got married with her boyfriend. Because after everything she lived through, everything she survived, she would like to continue living to give birth to children. I think that Oksana is a symbol of the whole Ukraine. We have awful wounds. At present, 243 children have been killed in Ukraine due to the events of the war. And all these atrocities and the results thereof are being investigated by the specialists. And before the investigation is finished, we do not know even how many people totally have been killed. Because, for example, in common graves in Mariupol, the Russians let neither rescue teams nor specialists so that nobody knows how many people have been killed here. And almost half of the children have lost their homes and the usual life. Several million of children are refugees now who left the country. And we hope and pray that they will come back. But at present, they are outside their home country. And the most important is that we, as Oksana, whom you see in the picture, would like to live. And we are fighting for our lives. And we are sure that we will win because we are fighting for the noble cause and for the truth. This is what is happening in my country. When, when I was uh, traveling uh, to a safe place where I can uh, uh, join a video conference, uh, I crossed Kiev and the sirens were roaring in the city and they are roaring every day. And we are getting used to it, but I don't want us to get used to the war. And we don't want you to guess to get used to the war which is going in Ukraine. This is the situation in my country. Panielena, thank you very much uh, for sharing uh, the pictures. And uh, I don't know. Uh, Elena, uh, I don't know whether you've seen that, but some people were crying in the audience and it's absolutely heartbreaking to see that. And when we look at these pictures, we understand how lives of each Ukrainian has changed during the last three months. And I bet your life has changed a lot as well. And I know that before the war started, the large scale war started, you were doing a lot of humanitarian projects. You were involved in uh, activities connected with the school food, with uh, you know, handicapped people. How is your humanitarian mission has changed? What is your big goal and what are you looking at right now at the First Lady? Well, uh, yes, thank you for this question. War has changed life of everyone in this country. And the projects which we were implementing prior to the war well, uh, not that uh, important and possible to improve because, for example, the food nutrition, which we wanted to improve so that our children become healthier, has been postponed because uh, the problem is now to provide food to a lot of people. 
And a lot of the work is being done in the humanitarian sector. And now we are focusing our attention on providing assistance to the most vulnerable categories of people who need this assistance most. And the first thing we've done when we saw that Russia is uh, raiding and bombing not only the military objects, but also uh, is hitting uh, the humanitarian objects, uh, hospitals, schools, residential buildings, we saw that it was necessary to, first of all, save the children who, for example, uh, are being treated for cancer in Ukraine. There were children who have just started the treatment and there were just children among them who had to take a very short uh, step to complete their treatment and rehabilitation, but all of them were under the threat, their lives were threatened. That's why we started to organize the project which we called the Convoy of Life. We brought out of Ukraine several hundred people with the cancer disease. And actually we made a stopover in Lviv where the children were examined by these uh, medician, physicians and the diagnoses were translated into the foreign languages and got them stabilized so that they could uh, continue moving forward. And then the next step was in Poland where the children were uh, sent to various countries and the children were accepted by France, Germany, uh, Turkey, uh, Spain, the United States. And we are grateful to all the countries uh, who have helped us in this endeavor and all these children now are safe. And we hope that they will win their war with cancer and that their parents can stop worrying about them and sleep uh, well, quiet nights. And uh, war also created a lot of new challenges which are related to various traumas and especially the traumas which are caused by the explosions of the landmines. You have seen the pictures. I've demonstrated that a lot of people need prosthesis assistance and this is very important for the children because the uh, you know procedure of providing prosthesis is much more complex. It is necessary to change these prosthesis while the child grows. That's why we are starting now the process of identifying an opportunity to get this assistance abroad for these children so that they get their prosthesis and they are being rehabilitated. And together with the Ministry of Health, we would like to ask the countries to plead the countries to help us to join this process if they have an opportunity to help. And also the children uh, uh, who do not have any... Uh, parents, the orphans, uh, we also are evacuating them from Ukraine. And the Switzerland in two cantons uh, have uh, accepted the children, a couple of uh, hundred of children. And we are so grateful to Switzerland for that. Now they are safe and they are enjoying the Swiss beautiful landscape. We also carry out humanitarian work inside Ukraine. We also help the foster families in, in Ukraine and also the family of many children. We are providing them with the humanitarian assistance and we provide everything starting from the pampers to the washing machines and we are trying uh, to provide the children uh, the children and their families with the first necessities and vital necessities. Several perinatal centers of Ukraine have received already incubators uh, for the newly born uh, kids, those who have been born prematurely. No matter whether it's war or not, but life is going on and Ukrainian women continue giving birth to the children and they are giving birth to children even in the home shelters, in subways. There were several places like this, but these are happy moments of the times of the war because it demonstrates that life is going on. There are a lot of projects and if there, there are questions about them, I can give you more detailed information about those projects, but maybe, well, we can uh, move forward after I've told a couple of uh, information, a couple of uh, about a couple of those projects which I'm implementing at present. Thank you very much. It's um, an amazing work that you are doing. Um, we didn't plan to talk about that, but I was on the way to Davos today in the morning. I was uh, watching your speech for the WHO that you delivered yesterday, and I was absolutely shocked with the story that you shared about people in Kharkiv that spent three months in the subway 
and now they are afraid to go up because their life is in the subway and that, that they are used to. And I understand how much we are all traumatized in different ways. If there is any plan to do something about that, to work with PTSD, to help civilians to uh, conquer this trauma that we are all going through, do you have a plan for that? Definitely. Uh, this is a very timely question, and we started to work on the national program of psychological rehabilitation because we understand that war is not only physical wounds, but I think that each person, each individual in Ukraine uh, is uh, overstressed, uh, mentally stressed, and the psychological traumas that happen to the people, and uh, also the PTSR is going to affect a lot of people, is affecting it now, and it's going to affect a lot of people after the war. So we need to do a lot of things to deal with these issues. We will be probably able to, we will be definitely able to free our area, territory from the invaders. But the country, the state, is not only the area, the territory, but it's the people. And it is difficult to arrange life for the, of, of people who have the PTSR. So now we started this work. The Ministry of Health, together with myself, uh, have appealed already to the WHO. And they promised to help us with the uh, expert assistance and also financial assistance so that they will be able to teach our specialists so that we get to the protocols of diagnosis and treatment from other countries but to be able to provide assistance to the psychological traumas, the, the PDCR. So, we, we cannot even imagine what problems we are going to face after the end of the war, but unfortunately these disorders might actually tell not only in one month after the awful events have uh, uh, stopped, but even oh, within the years after these uh, traumatic events uh, uh, have stopped. So that's why I asked the United States and Israel for the assistance. We ask them to provide us with the medical protocols. We know that they have huge expertise, especially in the work with the military men who are coming back from the war and with the families of uh, those military men. Uh, they all need assistance. This is going to be quite a large national program. We have to act quite quickly and efficiently here. Otherwise, we will lose time and uh, the consequences uh, uh, of these problems are going to be even much more grave. Thank you very much for mentioning international community and the need for international expertise. Uh, since we're in Davos and it's very international audience here, I would like you to talk maybe a little bit more about how did you manage to bring international leaders on board for your projects? Was it difficult? What was the, you know, the road to that? And uh, what are the countries and international leader, leaders and the first ladies and gentlemen are doing for Ukraine right now in collaboration with you? Uh, no, uh, at present, all the attention of the world uh, is uh, actually paid uh, to Ukraine. And that's why it's easier to work in this uh, uh, situation. And uh, when we are proposing the cooperation, a lot of uh, people are trying to assist. And uh, the, uh, I, last year, have started the Summit of First Ladies and Gentlemen, and we already going on from there. We have already established cooperation with the First Ladies and Gentlemen of the world, and it's easier for me now uh, to communicate with them, to work with them, to, and we have very close contacts with them. And I have, uh, 
had uh, uh, huge assistance from Brigitte Macron from France, uh, from uh, well, the uh, First Lady of Lusiania, Diana, and all other colleagues. I cannot even enumerate all those names because there are so many of those. And they pay attention to these joint projects. Uh, they are helping in the, the medical programs. Uh, today, uh, well, we already with Lusiania are opening the Ukrainian Center of Refugees in Lusiania, and it is going to help our refugees uh, and uh, those who, uh, who are going to stay for Lithuania for a certain time to feel comfortably in Lithuania and that this will be the place for their communication and uh, they will get important information there, the information which will, which will be vital for their lives. Poland uh, helps us a lot and uh, Poland is a neighbor uh, uh, on whom we can rely and uh, we can be proud of uh, the friendship with such a country. They have hosted millions of our refugees and we are so grateful to them for this. And also uh, when we were uh, meeting with Jill Biden, we've established a very good uh, c contact uh, uh, on uh, the personal level and we are going to work uh, on uh, the project of the uh, mental health uh, together with her and I would like to thank very much the First Lady of the United States for paying a visit to Ukraine during the times of the war and it's so really important now because first of all it was very dangerous and I am so grateful to her and I was impressed by the fact uh, how she was communicating very sincerely with the uh, people who live in Ukraine, who have moved uh, from other regions of Ukraine there because of the war. She was listening to them and she heard um, them. And I can see that uh, all this, uh, you know, pains echoed in her soul. And uh, the personal uh, relations with each of the first ladies uh, we have established, uh, well, have yielded results already. We were able to establish very good contacts, close contacts, and we are cooperating very fruitfully. Thanks a lot. I know that we are running out of time and we need to give floor to the questions, but I would just be brave and we'll break all protocols and I will ask you the most popular questions from all, all Ukrainians. How are you? Yakovy, Pani Olena. How are you personally, Ms. Olena? You know, I actually did not think that I can shed a tear and start weeping at the beginning of my uh, speech. Well, I'm holding on. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hold on. And I believe that everybody in Ukraine has to hold on. And we have a mem nowadays, um, I will tell you this story, uh, just a little bit, a short story. When uh, people came back to Borodyanka, a small township uh, in the suburb of Kyiv, which was destroyed by Russians, uh, people saw a building, a multi-story building, which was almost completely destroyed. But in the middle of that truly, there was just one wall which survived. And uh, there was a kitchen cabinet hanging on it. And there was even utensils there. And, and even the ceramic rooster was decorating uh, this uh, little, little uh, kitchen cabinet. This rooster was uh, presented to uh, uh, Mr. Johnson when he uh, visited Kiev. So now when people ask the question, how are you doing? We are giving an answer. We are holding on as that little cabinet in Borodyanka and we are waiting for our victory. Thank you very much. Again, sorry for very personal question. Maybe you weren't ready for that, but it's the most popular question Ukrainian is asking. My personal hero is a cat from Borodyanka that was saved after, I don't know, how, how many, 58 days. His anger face, you know, actually reflects the emotions Ukrainian feel towards what's happening. Now I have to give the floor to questions. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions, we have an assistant here 
who is ready to deliver the mic. So just raise your hand and we'll be right with you. Hi. Hello, everyone. I can't stand up because I'm in a wheelchair. My name is Leopoldin. I'm the former vice president of the World Disability Union. I'm also an award-winning filmmaker. I'm here today as the honorary advisor to Save Ukraine, Mikola Kulebas, NGO, your friend. The headlines cover the war without the focus on Ukrainian children who are killed, wounded, trafficked, raped, separated from their families, and those who cannot access basic needs, especially those with disabilities. We know about Oksana. I actually know Natalia. I just came back from Kyiv. I go to Ukraine every week on my wheelchair. Could tell you many, many stories. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Madame First Lady, your incredible speech. Uh, many encounters with children like yours who are, who are in the worst possible situations. At Save Ukraine, we identify and meet the needs of children, women, people with disabilities, orphan, elderly, everyone. Mikola and our team do their best to convince people to be evacuated. Like you mentioned, Madam First Lady, a lot of them are in basements, stuck without seeing daylight. <laughs> our mission is to make people's lives safer. We solve the most complex tasks of evacuation and escort and provide emergency assistance from hotspots, taking into account their needs. Uh, our number speaks better for, than ourselves, uh, than words, excuse me. Save Ukraine has so far evacuated more than 41,500,000 ,500 children and women. <laughs> I, I so, hate to interrupt, let's I, I go know, to the question. I'm, yeah. I, that is why I'm not going to ask a question to Madame First Lady. I'm going to ask a question to the world and to the audience here today. Will you join Madame First Lady's efforts? Will you join Save Ukraine's efforts into protecting the children of Ukraine as it is for a better future? Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. This question was not asked to me, it was not put to me, uh, the, but this is about our volunteers, about NGOs, and we are so many of those, and they are working so proactively. And during the World War, they constantly uh, demonstrate their very strong position, which has not changed uh, to what they have been doing before the war, but now everything has been even uh, augmented by them. And we know that the people in the wheelchairs is one of the most vulnerable categories. I know the family who simply were not able to go down to the bomb shelters because all the bomb shelters have stairs and people were sitting in their apartments and they were just wondering if the missile is going to hit their apartment or not. But uh, thank God they were able to be evacuated to a safe area in Ukraine. But could you imagine a family Family, a husband and a wife uh, who are uh, bound to the wheelchair. That's why I'm so grateful to the organizations who help such people. And each saved life is the huge assistance to Ukraine. And thank you very much. I cannot see you now, but I would like to extend my thanks to you. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you so much. Um, I really want to acknowledge you as a strong leader that inspires us. I believe that the world is uniting around Ukraine and that Ukraine has so much to teach the world about democracy, responsibility, and freedom. I would like to hear about your thoughts on the importance of women's leadership as we face the gravest challenges of our time, including 
what is happening in Ukraine. Thank you very much for this question. I always have been adhering to the following position. Democracy starts from equal rights and the equality between men and women is um, the, it should be a normal phenomenon, a normal thing, but unfortunately it's not very common nowadays. But we started to uh, create the equal rights uh, for men and women in our country since long ago. And actually we do not perceive our m women as second best. These are the teachers, military men, service, military service women, and uh, they are the physicians and they are actually opening their potential. And uh, there are certain examples, and uh, maybe this uh, uh, combination of words sounds a little bit strange, but we have a lot of examples of uh, women's bravery, and we can see these examples every day, and we are being inspired by them. The role of the woman is extremely important during the times of war, because war is an awful thing, which actually uh, brings up to the surface the most uh, bad feelings uh, uh, from the bottom of the soul of the of, of the people the, the anger uh, the uh, the inhuman feelings but the woman accumulates most of the human feelings and we really need uh, these feelings uh, uh, which are generated by uh, women the women are providing food to their children they are teaching their children in the uh, bomb shelters they are uh, evacuating their children outside the country. So the women are, uh, is a very important component of our future victory. And the woman is a symbol of regeneration of life in our country. This is what we are thinking and the dreaming about, to come back home, to you know, implement our plans, to give birth to children, to teach our children, to nurture our children, bring up our children. So the role, women's role as a leader during the war is important, it's enormous, and I can understand that very well. This is one of the symbols of the struggle and of the resilience. This is what I would say about the women's roles and women's leadership. Thank you very much for the question. And we have time for one maximum two questions. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Zelenska, for everything you have been doing for Ukraine, for Ukrainians, uh, for everybody uh, of us. Uh, and my question is, uh, you are talking right now to the international, prominent international audience here in Ukraine Davos House, uh, uh, who gathered for annual meeting called World Economic Forum. Uh, what else uh, international community can do for Ukraine to help Ukraine? Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. This is exactly what I would like to share with you today. And I understand that the forum in Davos is actually a forum of the representatives of big business uh, who are who have a lot of authority in their country, who have a huge influence and impact in the, in, on, in the international economy. So from the human point of life, it is very important not to get used to our war. Because when the war is being waged in some other country and it's going on for more than three months and it is so easy to get adjusted to it, the human psyche is built so that we are getting used to what is lasting for a long period of time. But it is impossible to get used to it. Please don't get used to it. This is my plea to you. And uh, the second item I would like to underscore uh, deals with the information war. Unfortunately, Russia is uh, uh, waging not only the physical war exterminating us, but they're waging information war and they are carrying it out all over the world. So when you uh, start thinking and you start, you know, like imagining that uh, to uh, assault another country, one might have a certain justification for that and uh, to carry out predatory actions, uh, might have some sense, it means that you are under the spell of the propaganda of Russia. Please uh, 
just be very careful with information which you are getting. Please uh, verify it and look what sources you're using. And the third item I would like to underscore, you are the representatives of big business, people who have an impact on the financial situation in the world. Actually, you can have an impact on your own societies and on the governments of your countries. So please don't let them uh, forget about us. Please continue the sanctions. It is necessary to help us to withstand this war. And I would like again to plea you, don't carry out business with the Russian invaders. Um. We have one more question coming, and probably we will wrap up, but we will see. Um, as a, a relatively new friend of Ukraine, um, we're all really inspired by you and all the people of Ukraine, and uh, your stories move us to action. And when we share your story with others, what's a key point that we should know and, and tell as a very, very new friend to Ukraine? It's an interesting question, new friends, you know, when you meet a, a new person, you start telling each other stories of your life so that actually learn more about each other. And now there are so many stories which Ukrainians are telling each other about ourselves. And we want to share those stories. But maybe, I don't know where to start. There are so many stories which are published in the mass media and they're being broadcast over the TV. But actually there are sort of intimate stories which people are sharing between the others. And uh, those whom they knew before, they did not know before, and they inspire. So I would like you to perceive Ukraine as a country which inspires, the people of this country is inspired. I am working now in a team that is uh, traveling uh, with the shows, concerts all over Ukraine, and uh, they are actually giving concerts to the military servicemen, to the, uh, to the uh, internally displaced people, People, so to improve their mood and uh, to support them during the difficult times of the war. And they meet a lot of different, various people. And quite recently, they uh, 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 gave a concert in the military hospital in Dnipro together with the musicians. And the military servicemen approached them uh, who, uh, who had a very difficult uh, wound uh, of the head and he lost his memory. And uh, he applied to our singer, who is very, very popular in Ukraine. He is a composer, a mu musician, and a, and a singer. And and this young man said, "You know, I I cannot recognize my wife after the wound, and I cannot recognize her. And she is so sorry for that. But I remember you because I love." your music. And Mitro even did not know what to answer. And he said that uh, uh, he was so moved by it. But this is a proof of the fact that Ukrainians, even during the war, remember what music is, what emotions are, which are given to us by the music. Again, another story about music. Our group was performing in Kharkov and a young man, a military serviceman from, uh, from the army came up to them and he was uh, carrying a violin and he's uh, fighting in the front line, but he never leaves his violin behind because when the war started, uh, he was uh, studying at the conservatoire. He was a first year student and he never leaves his violin behind. And he is practicing everywhere where it is possible to play a uh, violin. And he also joined uh, our uh, actors and he performed for the IDPs uh, from Kharkiv. And the music is, 
accompanying Ukrainians everywhere and always because music is part of the heart and soul of the Ukrainian people. Ukraine's music is beautiful landscapes and Ukraine is a dream about the future peace. This is what I would like to share with you and this is what I would like you to know about us. Thank you very much. That's very true. You know, watching these short videos on the internet of people singing Chervona Kalina, everybody it's observing people, you know, working and volunteering and singing. It's absolutely amazing. So room for one more question. Madam Zelensky, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for inspiring us with your speech. It's very touching, coming deep to our heart, and we are all willing to help. My name is Maria Spartalis. I was born in Kyiv, Ukraine, and I live over 20 years in Europe. And I want to show myself uh, the help to Ukraine, which I contribute. I'm a mother of three children. I'm a banker, but I help Borodenka. And I want to ask everyone else uh, to join me. And my question is, um, because I'm a mother and uh, you too, how do you imagine Ukraine after we win? How do you want to see it? How do you want to see a new Ukraine? which will win this war. Thank you. This is the most pleasant minutes of our life when we dream what is going to happen after the victory, how we are going to regenerate our country, how we are going to build new schools instead of those which have been destroyed by the occupationists, what beautiful hospitals we are going to build instead of those which have been destroyed, how we are going to take children to school again because it is impossible to do now, and how we are going to celebrate our holiday festivals in the main squares of our cities uh, without thinking that they are going to be hit by missiles. And I say that this is a dream of each mother, simply to come back to normal life to continue nurturing the children, to plan, to plan several months ahead, not only for two, three days ahead and the next week, but well, so that we will be able to plan how the children are going to grow, what are they going to do after they grow up, whether they are going to dance or they are going to play violin. We imagine our life is going to be even better than it used to be. We have huge plan and we hope that they are going to come true. And we hope that you will help us to implement those plans because it will be impossible for Ukraine to regenerate itself after the war without your assistance. And we can't wait for the victory. It would be an an absolutely ideal ending of our conversation, but universe gave us 10 extra minutes <laughs> because the conversation was so amazing. And uh, one more lucky person has an opportunity to ask the question, that gentleman on the fourth round. And promise we are wrapping up afterwards. <laughs> yeah, Madam First Lady, thank you for inspiring words. My name is Max Picherski. I'm Ukrainian based out of Helsinki. And uh, you, we, know, we all know there are a lot of refugees, many million of people that left their homes, but there are also people that lived before the war started abroad, and they're volunteering now. And there is so much energy required from them to kind of be integrated in the new environments. They actually, most of them do not have any experience of living abroad. Can you say some words of support for the volunteers that are bringing the energy to help refugees to land softly in the countries where they had to escape for safety. Can you support the refugees with, with some, give some words of support? Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. I support everyone who helps each other. And our volunteer movement has been very strong since uh, several years ago, but at present, 
it has become so strong that it makes one uh, wonder whether do they get their force. And I really admire volunteers who are helping the Ukrainian refugees outside Ukraine. And these are not only Ukrainian citizens, but also the citizens of those countries who are hosting the, the refugees, who are providing shelter and food for them. And there was a lot of information about how people were warmly met uh, the moment they crossed the border on the other side of the Ukrainian border. We, Ukrainians, all of us, thank from the bottom of our hearts to everybody who is helping us and who have helped us already. But we hope that those who left the, uh, we will come back. We are not speeding up things. We are not encouraging people to come back now because unfortunately, Ukraine is not safe yet everywhere. And if there is an opportunity, please stay together with the children in safe places. But we hope that this uh, awful situation is going to stop. And uh, we believe that each person who is helping the volunteer, uh, the people volunteer to help our refugees could be honestly called a hero. And sometimes, uh, well, it's enough to nicely talk to a person, maybe to provide the people with the first necessity is a great assistance to the people. And we appreciate it so much. And we are grateful to you for not forgetting us and for continuing assisting us. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the First Lady of Ukraine for joining us via video link. I should tell to Pani Olana that was the quietest session at Ukraine House Davos. It was really quiet here. Everybody was listening and I, I was excite, excited to hear the silence in the audience. It was an amazing 50 minutes. And um, thank you very much for being with us for these 50 minutes and for sharing the stories and uh, for being able to join us. and. I'm absolutely sure to inspire people in this audience and uh, thousands more who join us during the live broadcast. And I really hope that we all will see each other soon in, uh, in Kiev, in Ukraine, and celebrate the victory. Thank you very much. I would like to thank everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're an amazing audience, uh, absolutely amazing. We have five minutes before we shift to another session. So if you're interested in another session, please stay here. Otherwise, you're free to have some coffee.